Hello, bookworms. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them to tell us about their favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and my guest today is the hilarious and wonderful Margaret Sperling. Margaret chose a book that's also a personal favorite of mine, David Sedaris's classic expat memoir, Me Talk Pretty One Day. Margaret is a food tour guide based in Madrid, Spain, so I have to warn you, go renew your passport right now because your wanderlust will be off the charts by the end of this conversation. I'm telling you, I barely let our new best friend settle into her chair before I dove right in and asked her to tell us all about her life. I have a food tour company in Madrid. I'm originally from the Seattle area, but I moved to Spain back in 2007. And, um, you know, food and wine has always been my passion. And uh, just before the pandemic, so like the best timing possible in 2019, <laughs> I um, left my my uh, job teaching English and I started a wonderful neighborhood company that connects people who come to visit Madrid with all of the amazing food um, makers, producers, bars in this amazing city that I've gotten to call home for so long. Why Spain? By Spain. That's a great question. I it's just been a I was totally obsessed with Spain as a teenager. I started taking Spanish classes uh, in high school. And I think like the real origin story is that I saw this amazing Spanish movie, which if people haven't seen it, you should absolutely see it. Um, it's called Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown or Mujeres al Borde de un Ataque de Nervios by the Spanish director Pedro Almodóvar. And it's just this really, really, really crazy movie about these like kooky ladies living in Madrid. And I saw it and I was like, those are my people. I don't know. I just felt this like intense connection to this like total kooky, like brown haired world. Um, And so (laughs) I studied abroad in Granada in college. I studied Spanish in college, international relations. And like, I just, you know, the first time I was in Spain, at the beginning of my study abroad year, I was like, this is just, this is where I want to be. And I kind of had this like singular focus on coming to Spain. And in 2007, a friend of mine uh, was living here and I came to visit her and I never went home. And so, you know, she moved to the U S and her husband always jokes and he's a physicist. So he always jokes that it's not the brain drain that he left Spain. It was the brain exchange that he (laughs) went to the U S and I came here. And I was like, that's not, it doesn't seem fair that Spain lost a physicist and got an English teacher slash food tour guide. Um, But yeah, so it's always, for me, it's always been Spain. I love it here. I love the energy. I love the people. I love the food. I hate driving. So I don't have to drive, which is great. Okay. It's I have never wonderful. been to Spain. I've always wanted okay. to go. What if I said, yeah. like, show me the the really esoteric part of Madrid? What would you show me that's unique that most tourists don't know? You know, honestly, the food tours that I designed were, were pretty much to answer that question. Because I used to work for a big food tour company that would take people around the city center. You'd do a little ooh-ah at the Royal Palace, which is what we all want to do is ooh-ah the Royal Palace, and then see all the beautiful, you know, old buildings surround old buildings is the architectural term, by the way, for okay. all of the things that, you know, surround <laughs> the Royal palace and the historic city center. Um, but what I wanted to do is kind of get people into like, what's the essence of Madrid. And so I think the essence of Madrid is the little neighborhoods. And so I live in a great neighborhood here. It's called Malasana. It's in the city center. And, um, I think the best part of Madrid is like the people in the bars and the cafes. And so I think that we would just like dive in, you know, go to the first place. Um, the one of the like really iconic classic things that you do in Madrid is you go out for cañas and cañas are just little beers. So instead of it being a pint or a different glass, it's a teeny glass, you know, it's, you know, it's like 10 sips of beer. Uh Um, And so you'd start with cañas um, in, you know, what are called the old man bars here in Madrid, where there's kind of like bad lighting and, you know, a very old man in a very bad mood pouring the beer. (laughs) And so we'd have one of those and maybe some olives. And then the other thing is the markets. So the markets in Spain are really spectacular. When you're in one of the markets, you really get a sense of what's special and amazing about Spain. This is like an outdoor market. These are indoor markets. Um, And so 
Madrid and pretty much all Spanish cities have these kind of big indoor market structures. It's not okay. like a farmer's market. It's like where people go to buy their food. There's the butcher stand, the fruit stand, uh, the cheese guy. Um, and then there's little bars in there and you go in and it's like you're in, it's like you're in a separate state. You know, it's like a fiefdom. It's like a little market fiefdom. You know, it's like <laughs> there's all of the different, you know, microcosm of society in there and people, you know, working and in eating and drinking and sometimes a pigeon flies in <laughs> and, and they're really cool places. And it's, you know, I remember the first time I went to a market when I came to Spain, that feeling of like, this is not the supermarket, you know? And that is a very special feeling. Yeah. Um, and you have these, and so when people come to Madrid, you have this opportunity to be in this big bustling metropolitan city. And, and then you duck into one of these markets and you're in a totally different dimension. And then you duck back out and you're back in the city. And then you go into one of the little bars and you're back into the, you know, it's, it, there's just so many contrasts. So that's what I would do. I would do oh little bars, canas, and markets. So what is, what's the book life like in Madrid? Do you have a good uh, bookstore scene there? There are actually, and, and people oftentimes ask me this, there are a surprising number of bookstores in central Madrid and even still a ton of small and independent run bookstores. Oh, you know, nice. Spanish people don't actually read a ton. Um, we have, I, I don't remember what the exact numbers are, but we're like one of the European countries that watches the most um, TV per person huh. uh, in Europe. But books are, books have a special place. Books are a very popular gift. Um, and so people really, people go to the store, buy a book, get it wrapped and bring it to you for your birthday. Oh. Um, and so that's really an important part. There's some really wonderful um, used bookshops in the city center. There's actually a couple of even really wonderful international bookstores that were opened um, by folks who come to Madrid from the UK and from the US. And so there's some really great English language bookstores, but there's also a new kind of bubbling up trend of bookstore wine bars. So here in my neighborhood, there's a, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in of places that have bars inside small bookstores. And oh that's been really fun. Um, yeah. And these are also, it's wonderful because they're also like Spanish presses. Uh, graphic novels have become very popular. Um, sort of different kinds of illustration formats have become also much more popular. And so there's these places where you can find, you know, Spanish comics. Uh, and drink a glass of wine. Everyone. You are obviously, I mean, I've, I've heard you now a couple times speak in Spanish. You're obviously fluent. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, what do you read in? Do you read in English or Spanish? I think that bilingual is such a complicated term. I know that probably not everyone has so much hand wringing with whether or not things are bilingual or people are bilingual, but I, I feel for myself that I am fully fluent um, and bilingual is hard for me to to say because, you know, I didn't grow up speaking Spanish. Okay. I moved to Spain in my late twenties. And so I, you know, I, I fully live my life in Spanish, but I still think in English and my inner monologue is in English. And for me, it's such a fluid process. And, and particularly since I didn't grow up speaking Spanish and certainly didn't go to school in Spanish, I, I feel fully confident and comfortable speaking in Spanish and I, I conduct my daily life in Spanish, but I love, I love to read and I love to read in English, but my, I do, when I think about my journey with books, my first like true book loves were Latin American writers. And I remember, you know, I read Gabriel Garcia Marquez in, in English when I was a teenager, I read love in the time of cholera. And that was my first like book, like book, love, like book devotion was when I read that book. I was like, this is it. Like, this is what, this, this is why we're here. Like, we are here on the planet for words like this and stories like this. And so magical realism for me was, you know, all through high school and college, that's kind of all I wanted to do. Um, and I just, I just loved those books and those stories so much. But, you know, now, even though I do feel so comfortable speaking in in Spanish, I still love reading in English. I think also just in terms of the relaxing element of reading, if I also have to be paying attention to the language, it is a little bit more difficult. 
Have you gone back and read Gabriel Garcia Marquez in Spanish since your high school experience of reading it in English? You know, I haven't. I should totally do that. Do you know, the only reason I ask is because uh, I believe it was last November I had Adrian Cepeda um, on talking about 100 Years of Solitude. And he told me mm -hmm. that he read it in English and then went back and read it in Spanish. And it mm -hmm. was a different experience. I'm sure that it would be. I mean, and it's, you know, I think also, Julie, I, I should totally revise my, I should revise my position. I have this thought, you know, every couple of years that I should completely revise my position. I should start reading in Spanish. Um, because like when we were talking about the movies that I love, the Spanish films that I saw that made me so obsessed with Spain, I saw them. I've seen those, the Almodovar movies in Spanish in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. And it's a completely different experience because of course my 14 year old self, I couldn't speak Spanish at all. And so those, the movies were just about the visuals and the feelings and the, like the, the crazy energy. But now that I told that I feel so comfortable in the language, like hearing the words gives it a really different sense. So I'm going to, you're right. I'm going to do that. That's a project. <laughs> 2022. I, You've convinced I'm not, me. No, I'm not <laughs> trying to convince anybody of anything. I'm just curious because <laughs> I don't have I that kind of facility with language. I have a glancing mm -hmm. knowledge of other languages mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't have the capacity. And so I'm always really curious what a book would be in its written language and then in the language that we read it in. The whole question of translating is so difficult and particularly, you know, for those of us for whom words form such an important part of our identity and ourselves and our kind of passions and dramas, it's, it can be very complicated because you, you know, I, for me, the way that the sentence is formed is so important, both when I'm speaking, when I'm reading. And so I, I guess I've never kind of given up on, I'm better at English. English is my dominant language, so I shouldn't even try. Um, but I, I think that that's, I, I'm going to, I think I'm going to work on this for 2022. Now that we're at these, these, the, we're having revelations as we're talking. I'm feeling great about this. <laughs> this is incredible. Well, is yeah. there also some comfort to it? Like, um, you can sort of relax your guard a little bit when you're reading in English. I think there's a certain level of rest and comfort and the, the kind of emotional comfort of seeing English words on a page. I mean, I, you know, I read the newspaper in Spanish also just to kind of, you know, be informed about everything. Um, and I mean, I can certainly read a newspaper article. I mean, that's what I have most contact with is reading the newspaper in mm -hmm. Spanish or magazines, different, you know, press sources. I, I don't, it's very, it's, I don't feel like it's difficult. It's not difficult to read a news story. So I guess I just, since I've never really read novels in Spanish, I mean, I did for university and, you know, sometimes if I'm on vacation somewhere and there's no books, you know, if I finish my book yeah. and there's a bookshelf on, you know, a bookshelf of books in Spanish, I'll grab something, but it doesn't have the same, it doesn't have the same pull for me. I see. Were you always a reader? <laughs> I was, I, I struggled when I was a little kid starting to read. And once I picked up steam, I, I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And I've always, you know, I remember my first boyfriend uh, said to me that when he saw me reading, that it was like, I was consuming books rather than reading them. And he was like, you can't, the, what most people have, which I also have when you're watching television and the world disappears around you. He's like, when you're reading the whole world around you disappears, which is probably why I like reading so much. Um, but it's, it's actually a really wonderful story how I came to books um, that I, I really was struggling, you know, in first instance, you know, when kids are starting to read. And um, I remember that one of the problems was that all of my little friends we're reading the babysitter club books in elementary school. And I just thought they were so stupid. And so, you know, my parents were concerned about my reading. I had a reading tutor and I remember him just saying, you've got to read books. Like you have to do it. And I was like, I don't like the books that there are for kids. Um, uh -huh. And I was really upset about it. And I remember like, just you think about the people who changed your life and the librarian in my elementary school when I was in like, you know, second or third grade, uh, she, you know, we were having library time and she was like, well, what do you want to read? And I was like, well, I don't like the babysitter club, <laughs> <laughs> which I know for like eighties girls is, is, you know, kind of heresy, but I didn't. 
And she said, well, maybe you'll like this. And she got me this series or she, you know, found this series of, you know, biographies of famous women. And the first book that she showed me was a biography of Winnie Mandela. And I remember that I read the book and I was like, this is it. This is it. And then I really was on an anti-apartheid kick. So really it kind of, it brought everything to my life. It brought me books. It brought me a sense of social justice. And so for me, like reading is just that ability to connect with other people and their stories and, you know, transport yourself to another world. And so that I just, and her name was uh, Mrs. Dubin. Wherever you are, Mrs. Dubin, thank you so much. We, I can't tell you how many times I have heard that on this podcast where mm-hmm. one person just got the right book in someone's hands at, at the Absolutely. right time. And I think about that a lot. Whenever there's a really trendy book for kids, you know, my son's best friend hated the Harry Potter books and so thought he wasn't mm-hmm. a reader because exactly. everybody else was reading Harry Potter. No, you like sports biographies and that was his thing. But mm-hmm. The way kids interpret that is, I'm not interested in Harry Potter, therefore I'm not a reader, you know, or I'm mm-hmm. not interested in babysitter clubs, so I must not be good at reading. Kids always think like that mm-hmm. when that's not the case at all. It's just the right mm-hmm. book wasn't put in your hands until that time. And it's just mm-hmm. those people who can spot that. I think they're miracle workers. Absolutely. I mean, for me, it changed everything. Yeah. And I just, it's really, you know, I think about that all the time. When I think, you know, my sense of self and my sense of, you know, everything, like my place in the world and social justice and and things that I think are important, you know, kind of everything changed because of that. What are your preferred genres these days? I really love, I really love novels written by people who are just nothing like me. So I love anything about experiences that are completely different from my own, because then I feel like I'm just getting... I'm getting two for the price of one. You're like, I'm getting this <laughs> entertainment experience and I'm getting all this perspective. Do you finish books you dislike? No. No. There's so many books to read. You know, I will say my my sister-in-law is a very, very, very serious reader. And so she she just sends me lists of books to read, which is great because I love to read, but I don't like choosing books. So <laughs> I just read, I basically now just read whatever my sister-in-law tells me to read. I just finished uh, Detransition Baby, which I liked. I just got it at the library. It's right there. Oh, good. It's okay, really, tell me. It's a, it's a fascinating book. And I didn't like it at the beginning. And Mabel had said to me, you're not going to like it at the beginning, but just just stick with it. And I was, and if she tells me you're not going to like it at the beginning, stick with it, then I'll stick with it. But, okay, good. I'm so glad you told yeah. me that because otherwise I would have started it and gone, okay, not for me. Stick with it. Stick with it. You're going to need to wait. It's almost at like the halfway point where just something shifts and the whole thing just opens up. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you told me that. We'll get right back to the delightful conversation with Margaret Sperling in just a moment. But first, I want to take a quick break to remind you that a great way to support this podcast for free is to hit that subscribe button on your podcast player. That way you'll never miss a bookish conversation. And don't forget to share this episode with your favorite traveling friend, your favorite David Sedaris fan, and on your favorite social media channel. Make sure you tag me when you do it, because I love to see it. And I'm so grateful for your support. Now, back to the show. Do you remember how you first came across the book we're talking about today, Me Talk Pretty One Day by David Sedaris? I don't. I think, you know, in the early 2000s, David Sedaris, uh, you know, in Seattle, you just read David Sedaris. So I don't, I don't know if someone gave it to me. It was every, everyone had that. It was one of those books where you would go to the, the what is it? The God of small things. You know, you, you went into people's houses. Is that the name of that book? Yeah. The God of small things. Uh, R and Roy. Yeah. Roy. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. <laughs> you went into people's houses and those were the books that were there. Um, and so I just read David Sedaris probably because everybody did. I've, I've been listening to this American life since it was mm-hmm. a radio show and you would have to sit in the car um, because yes. you couldn't get out um, yes. until it was finished. So I had heard um, Christmas on Ice or the Elf Story, whatever it's called, um, on This American Life. And I was like, who is this magician? And I read that. I, I believe that I read Me Talk Pretty one day the first time just after I had come back from studying abroad in, in Spain. So okay. the like rawness and the connection to learning a new language. I just remember really connecting with that. And I mean, David Sedaris is just so funny. 
but I don't know that before I read David Sedaris, I had read someone who just made me hysterical laugh. Um, and that was, that was amazing. I mean, he's so fun. The books are so funny. And it's, you know, since we've been um, talking about doing this, I've been going back and reading some of the stories from Me Talk Pretty one day. And I just read um, Calypso, which I also really liked. Um, but it's so, so funny and so human. And then, mm-hmm. you know, I've seen him read. I love his audiobooks and I love everything he's done on This American Life. So just getting to like think about how he would say it is also just makes it even that much better. Did you get to go up and get a book signed by him? I don't love standing in lines. Okay. Um, I saw him <laughs> I saw him years ago and I didn't I didn't wait in the line. No. Have you gotten a book signed by him? No, but I've gotten books okay. signed by lots of authors. I will stand mm-hmm. in yeah. line for authors. But mm-hmm. um I have read about him that when you get a book signed by him, I've read this multiple times that he draws goofy pictures next to his signature. Oh my god. And that he never says typical questions like, "Hey, thanks for coming." He always like Right when uh-huh. a person walks up, he says, have you ever petted a pig? Or like he asks, like, uh-huh. ha- have you ever been bitten by a bat? Like he just asks weird, random, <laughs> offbeat questions. And I mean, what a bizarre thing to do, but also what fun conversations you would have. Well, I mean, I think that that's the essence of David Starr. You know, he even talks about that in his work that, you know, he people always say to him and, and it comes up in his stories where he's saying like, you know, people are like, how does such weird stuff happen to you? And he's like, well, cause I court weird. And I, I, that's another thing. I might've even first heard about that from him that, you know, I feel like that too, that, you know, my friends are, you know, back when I was teaching English, my English students would ask me like, how does so much crazy stuff happen to you? And I think that, you know, there's a couple of different ways to think of, you can think about the David Sedaris way. You know, if you ask 700 people in a room, um, have you ever pet a pig? You're going to get some good stories. Um, so if you you put yourself into a position where weird stuff is going to happen to you, and also you know for you know it's David Sedaris obviously in a league of his own, but you know I do consider myself in my own small way a storyteller. Um, for those of us who love telling stories, part of weird stuff happening to you is that you tell the weird stuff that happens to you. I mean, I'm sure that millions of weird things happen to people all the time that they don't doesn't even register. But since any anything that's even like a glimmer of weird happens to me, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to tell this story to everyone. <laughs> and I have, you know. So yes. I do think that David Sedaris combines the courting of weirdness and the joy in the sharing of weirdness. When you give this book to other people and tell them this is one of your favorites, what do you tell them it's about? How would you describe this book to someone who has never come across it? You know, I used to give it to a ton of my English students. Um, it's very hard to read in English, but it is worth it. Um, you do, you miss a lot, but it is, it is, it is worth it to go through it. Um, and even, you know, even explaining David Sedaris jokes, it's funny. I mean, most people, you can't explain a joke. It loses everything, but David Sedaris jokes, you can explain them and they're still funny. Um, he's that good. So I say to people, when I think about me talk pretty one day, I, this is the essence of moving to another country and trying trying to talk and we all try and talk and I think you know since I've spent so much of my life thinking about languages thinking about how you learn them and how you experience them and how yourself exists in another language that that struggle to be like I am smart I just can't be smart right now because I don't know the words yes and that is an experience that is it is it is truly humbling and I wish that everyone got to have it um and then and because it, it gives you this whole new perspective on like who we all are. Yes. You know, we are our words. And if you don't have the words, it doesn't mean you are not. It just means you just don't have that word in that moment. It's about people and migration and our, you know, shared humanity. It's so hard because, you know, we have so many translation softwares available now. And there's the different ways that we can have simultaneous translation through our phones and all different kinds of things. Mm. But the, the essence of the way that we speak and the words that we use, and even, you know, it's been so interesting for me over the years to get to live in Spain for so long and be so immersed in, in not even just Spanish culture, but like my Madrid culture and my Madrid friends. And, you know, our like 41 year old urban, no children lifestyle slang, you know, it's like, it's Mm -hmm. like you, you create these micro tribes. And within our micro tribes, there's language. 
And to get to be a part of that in another culture has been has been so incredible for me. But then it makes you realize like how much you miss of the rest of the world. Like once you see that there's this tiny thing that you've been given access to, then you realize, well, then there's, you know, whatever, seven and a half billion of us now out there or however much we are. Yes. And everyone has that. And we don't, you know, you can see, you can watch the movies or you can read the books or you can, you know, listen to the music, but the, the subtext to the subtext takes so long to get that it's, it's both exciting and demoralizing that (laughs) to know how much, you know, the more, you know, the more, you know, you don't tell me what you think of his portrayal of his family, because he has, would you, would, would you say quirky is a fair word? Of, of his 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 large family I love them I mean I, I think that they're quirky them. I love them and I you know I love his sister I think also now that we know more about Amy Sedaris because she's also become such a public personality and I I adore her mm-hmm. um I think they are quirky I think we're all quirky I I actually think that it goes back to the like the courting of weirdness and the sharing of weirdness that if we were to really get into our families. Yep. And, and kind of who they are and what they are. I don't know that David Sedaris's family is any quirkier than the rest of us. It's just that he spent a lot of time talking about them. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I I think that they are quirk. There are certainly quirks and like two of them are, you know, extremely famous for being weird. And so that's super cool. You know, in my family, we're not famous for being weird, but we are weird. Um, (laughs) Yes. I don't like it when people say like dysfunctional family, you know, like that doesn't seem fair. Yeah. And that's a word that's thrown around about him a lot. Like this offbeat dysfunctional family. But the thing, the reason I asked you that is because I've read all of his books and I have never Mm. thought that he was cruel or disliked his family at all all. In fact, I think he's he's very loving and very protective of them, but he's Mm -hmm. absolutely fearless about Mm -hmm. displaying their quirks or their odd habits or their, you know, sarcasm. I come from Mm -hmm. a very sarcastic family, so this language is very familiar to me. (laughs) I like the way that he rejects that. I mean, I've actually heard interviews of him talking about how he doesn't like it when people call his family um, dysfunctional because, and I, I do agree, it's not they're mm, I don't think they're any quirkier than anyone else. Um, it's just he has this magical way of talking about them. Uh, and his dad, you know, like lived for you know, lived to be so old and you know, may we all live to be so old and crotchety and get to have someone tell such wonderful stories about us. I think that just takes such incredible skill to be able to tell stories that are he's so candid but not cruel. He's such a good writer. It's like the he's so good at you know, and he's such a good studier of people. And and I I love it. I I love his work. I love his words. I love, I I love the world that he creates. I just, I, I really, I I just, I just love it. So I'm kind of, I'm just all in, you know? You mentioned the Santa Land Diaries where a lot of people was the Mm -hmm. first time most of us found him. NPR replayed Mm -hmm. that as an episode just before Christmas. And yeah, it holds up. It is still so it is perfect. Funny. It is yeah. perfect. I listen to it. I, I think I probably listen to it every year. Um, that's how Jews get into the Christmas spirit. Um, <laughs> we listen to the Santa Land Diaries. Um, <laughs> and um, it's just the essence of the human experience. You know, it's like that incredible way that David Sedaris combines just like laugh out loud hilariousness with these incredibly astute observations about like the essence of the human condition. What are you reading these days? Um, I actually just started um, Commonwealth by Ann Patchett. Um, my sister mm-hmm. <laughs> recommended that I read Commonwealth. Um, and she said, Oh, have you heard? And I actually, I love Ann Patchett. Mm-hmm, and I, um, I read Bel Canto. And I just remember thinking like, what is this? And then the truth and beauty is just such a devastating book. And I mean, her books are incredible. I mean, there was a time when I just, I just read everything that I could get my hands on by her. And I I, I stopped for some, I don't know why, but this book, it's just, I mean, 
she is such an incredible writer. Like the, the, the words that she uses and the way that she creates characters and people's lives. And it, it kind of doesn't matter what she's talking about. It's mm-hmm. so beautiful. And the observations are so spectacular. I love her and Commonwealth. I'm about a third of the way through and I'm, I am just, I am all, it is beautiful. It's a spectacular book. Oh, that is so good to hear. I haven't read it, but mm-hmm. I am in the middle of listening to um, the Dutch house. Oh, and by her. And I, mm-hmm. I think it, it's either right before or right after Commonwealth. Okay. It's fairly recent. And same thing. Mm-hmm. I just, uh, I keep thinking, oh my God, what she can do. She, I her know. words are so evocative. They're so, so evocative good. in the dialogue and the characters. And you're just, you are, it is a, it's just transformative. I mean, you just get in there and you can't get out. It's mm-hmm. so good. Yeah. Um. I love it. And as I said, I just read Detransition Baby, which is a is a complicated read, but I I really liked it. And I think more than anything, you know, the opportunity to, you know, read a book about trans women written by a trans woman is is kind of why we read, to get to have that um, opportunity to to hear that perspective. Margaret, will you tell my listeners where they can find you online? You can find me on Instagram at, at walk and eat Spain. And, and I'm going to the... interrupt you, by the way, listeners, mm-hmm. you have to go follow this. It is the most <laughs> delicious Instagram feed. It is so beautiful. It just makes me starving. <laughs> well, thank you. That's, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make people hungry all the time. Yes, um, it's working. Give people a real good, my <laughs> vision with the Instagram is to really give people a sense of what life is like in Madrid. And um, our, my website is walkandeatspain.com as well. I'm also on Facebook at Walk and Eat Spain. And, you know, the we're all kind of being armchair travelers these days. So if you have any questions about, you know, how to, how to achieve Spain Wanderlust, I am always available for um, a quick orientative uh, message exchange with some ideas. And it's, you know, Madrid is a great city. And as soon as people are able to travel, we would love to have you here. So Ugh, I cannot wait. I'll be there. Come and visit. Well, this has been so much fun. I hope you will come back anytime you have a book you want to tell me about. It has just Absolutely. been delightful talking to you. So much. It was so wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Bookworms, I don't know about you, but after talking to Margaret, I am totally ready to move to Madrid. I also want to reread all of my David Sedaris books. What about you? Are you going to read Me Talk Pretty one day? Let me know on Instagram at Best Book Ever Podcast. I really look forward to hearing your thoughts on this episode. Remember, you can find links to all the books we discussed in the show notes or on my website at bestbookeverpodcast.com. And if you have a book you want to tell me about, click on the Be a Guest button, either at the website or the Instagram bio, and we can chat. Thank you for joining me today. I will see you at the library. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. You you kind of killed the vibe there, but it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I know, always, always bring up Anne Frank. You know, get a Jew on your show, even one who lives in Spain. And she's like, you know, what we're going to talk about is the Holocaust. <laughs> okay, thank you for keeping it real. <laughs> You're welcome.